with uh, Thanksgiving coming up this week, and of course in anticipation of that, uh, just uh, not always uh, one to preach on a particular theme, uh, but since it's been on uh, our minds, and uh, especially if you uh, you work, you look forward to a few days off, maybe some time to spend with the family, but uh, you know, Thanksgiving has really got pushed to the side in a world that we live in, and um, you go, and as uh, soon as uh, it gets, uh, seems like past uh, Labor Day, you start seeing Halloween stuff on the shelves, and then before Halloween even gets here, you see Christmas stuff right on the same shelf. You got Halloween costumes, and then you got like stockings and decorations and things like that, and so uh, we're so rushed, and, and, and Halloween becomes more about the individual. You know, they go out and see how much candy they can get, and of course, you know, uh, all the stuff, it's, it's a me holiday, and Christmas has become so commercialized that it has turned into a me holiday. Uh, what am I going to get? You know, uh, what the kids look forward to, what they're going to get. And so uh, those are so focused on uh, their sales, it's easy to see how Thanksgiving can fall by the wayside because Thanksgiving is not a holiday that's about you. Uh, Thanksgiving is a, is a holiday to, to re- reflect and to be appreciative and to be thankful for what you have. And so in order to be thankful and to, in order to be appreciative, you have to realize that that came from someone else. And the whole thing about being thankful and for Thanksgiving is to be thankful to God. And you can see why the, the world we live in doesn't really want to push Thanksgiving. There's no, uh, there's no real uh, hoopla made over it. And, and Christmas and Halloween, they're competing for uh, who spends the most money on the decorations and the candy and all the stuff. And, and, and Halloween is, is fastly approaching uh, the amount that's spent on Christmas. But then you have Thanksgiving in the middle. In between two holidays that's associated about me, there's a little holiday that we are to set aside and be thankful to God. We shouldn't do it one time a year, but that's the, the, the day and the time that we do uh, plan and celebrate and, and to reflect. And so I want to challenge you this week. Um, Christmas is coming, and, and the kids get excited about Christmas, and it seems like once they get through the Thanksgiving break, uh, they know Christmas is right around the corner. And so, But I want you this week to be thankful to, to God. I want this week to not be about you or, or, or to about what uh, you're excited about, maybe the kids, and remind the kids it's not about just them. It's, it's a time to reflect on what God has done for you uh, in your life. And so we're going to look at a passage in First Chronicles. So if you have your Bibles, uh, open them up to First Chronicles. Uh, chapter 16 is where we're going to be. First Chronicles chapter 16. While you're finding that, I'm going to read a couple of passages out of uh, Scripture and just let you know kind of what the mindset is. We, we do live in a world that's becoming a, um, a me-centered type attitude. Uh, there's no appreciation. There's no, uh, there's no thanksgiving. There's no thankfulness. We live in a day and age where uh, there is a generation growing up and, and, and they, they expect. Uh, this is an expected generation instead of a thankful generation. And so we're going to be in First Chronicles chapter 16. Uh, but before I read there, I'm going to I just want to read a couple of passages. You find your place. That's the, the focal point of where we're going to be. But there's an attitude that that's coming. And if you if you think about this, uh, a lot of these express the day and age that we live in. But Second Timothy, chapter three, I'm going to read these to you. We're going to go to First Chronicles. Second Timothy, chapter three, it says that. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves. We, we do see that attitude today. It's it's a it's about me. It's a me generation. OK, uh, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents unthankful and unholy we we live we do we live in a in a time where uh many people are they're unthankful uh they're they're uh, um instead of being thankful they complain because they didn't get what they thought they should have got or they didn't get as much as they thought they should have got and so there's an unthankfulness that that we do have uh and it says that uh this is the the generation that's to come and it says having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people turn away uh there's also a passage over in romans i'll read this and we're going to go to first chronicles because i want you to see this is the attitude of what's to come and we see evidences of it now but we're going to compare it to how it was in first chronicles but over in uh, romans chapter one this is the last verse i'll read before we get to our our passage scripture over in romans chapter one again it, it speaks of an unthankfulness romans chapter uh, one over in verse 21, it says that because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
You see, all an attitude of unthankfulness. And so as we approach this week, we want to just be the opposite. We want to, be, we want to have the attitude of thankfulness. And so we've looked at uh, a couple of passages in the New Testament of the attitude to come and, and, and the attitude that we actually see many people in our day and age. But let's look back and see how we're supposed to be. Uh, David is writing a, a, a psalm here. And it's not a psalm in the book of Psalms. It's actually a psalm of David in the book of First Chronicles. So First Chronicles chapter 16, uh, they're moving the ark. So we're going to read a few verses and kind of go through this. Uh, chapter 16, verse 1, it says, So they, they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that God had uh, erected, that uh, David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. They were having a service to praise and be thankful unto the Lord. Why? Because of everything he had done for them up until this point, for everything that uh, he had delivered them and, and, and the battles and the blessings and, and, and even the judgments, even, even the hard times. Um, David was establishing this time and this place of worship all to give thanks to God. It was never about him. Now, look at this. Look at verse seven. It says, on that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Again, this whole focus of this, this area here that we're looking in is they were giving thanks to God. They were giving thanks to Him. It's really what we should do every day, but if, if no other day, at least this week, when it comes time and, and we're to uh, be thankful and the, and the theme and, uh, of everything around us is to be thankful, the key is, is in this world to recognize who to be thankful to. We're not to really be thankful uh, to ourselves. We're not to be thankful to others because everything that we have here on this earth, it's a gift from God. Now, we can be thankful to our parents because they've made sacrifices and there's, th- there's people that have done things for us. But ultimately, even their ability to do something for you came from God. And ultimately, everything that we have to be thankful for goes back to God. And so it's to Him that we're to be thankful for. Look at verse 8. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. It was so easy who they were worshiping. It was so easy to, to recognize who they gave praise to. And, and you can go back and, and you can read chapter 15 sometime. If you want to look at the preparation, this was not a little service where they said, hey, last minute, let's, let's get together and praise the Lord. I, I don't have the time and, and I would lose you. But go back and read chapter 15 sometime at all the people that were appointed just to transport the ark. Just It was like a parade just to transport the art. They had the horns and the trumpets and the, the musicians and the song of praise and the shouting and the dancing to move the ark. And it was all to give honor and glory to God. And so they, they get to this point and, and David writes this psalm, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. It's the Lord that, uh, that, that we should rely upon. It's, it's the Lord who desires us to call upon him. There, was, there were many times when when God allowed uh, during famine or during the, in the land that the children of Israel, he would send them to Egypt for protection. He, he used Egypt as a shield when, when many times things would, would come in and, and they would take refuge and it was under God's directions. But, you know, there was one time uh, that, that they went down and God didn't really tell them to go down there. And he scolded them because then they had become so dependent on Egypt, they had forgot who they were dependent upon. See, it was God who was directing them. It was God who had blessed Egypt. It was God who had lined that up. And so they had gotten so used to doing this when persecution came and when times came, instead of praying to God, they just went to Egypt. And God didn't like that because the Bible says He is a jealous God. He wants us to serve Him. He wants us to rely upon Him. And so David is saying, call upon His name. Make known His deeds. It's all about God, it's all about Christ in our lives today. It's all about what he's done for us. First and foremost, the first thing you better be able to tell somebody here today is the day that he saved you. The day that he pushed on your heart, you gave in to him and and you repented of your sins and now you became a child of God. That's the first deed you should be able to tell somebody. And then you should be able to look back all in your life and through biblical wisdom and and through the Holy Spirit. and, And maybe you didn't see it at the time, but now looking back through a spiritual set of glasses, you see all the times in your life where God was uh, in your life and where God had his hand upon your life. And if it wasn't for God having that, you would have never made it through that point in your life. And it says to to thank him and make known his deeds. See, that's part of of sharing the good news is is not just to 
share the gospel with with that, uh, with a sinner. That's first and foremost. But then share the good things. Uh, share the the joy that uh, a relationship with Christ has brought to you. Share the uh, peace and the the comfort that you have. There, you'd be surprised at the people that are looking for peace, that are looking for some type of comfort in the world, and they look and they they go in all these places and they don't find what they're looking for because they haven't found Christ. And so many times we don't share that, and so we're commanded here to to give thanks to God, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the people. Then verse 9 says, sing to him. Listen, all music, all music was made and created to give honor and glory to God. We're to sing our praises to him. Uh, We're to lift his name up in in our songs. Sing songs to him. Verse 9 says, talk of his wondrous works. This sounds like a man who's excited about knowing God. This, this sounds like a man who, who's experienced God firsthand. And, and we know David had. But listen, every one of us, if we've experienced salvation, we should have this same excitement and joy in our life. If we've known Christ as our Lord and Savior, we've known Him in a way that David's known Him. When we look upon our life and we see God moving in our life, we, we have the same testimony that, that David had. Maybe we didn't go through the extreme things that David did. But listen, God has had a hand in your life from the time that you were conceive even before then up until this very point and he will continue to have a hand in your life until you draw your last breath and so we all have this same testimony we're to sing of his praises we're to talk of his wondrous works verse 10 says glory in his holy name holy name let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the lord see that's the only ones who can truly be thankful and rejoice in this time is is those who are seeking god who are seeking the Lord, uh, not seeking comfort in, a, in the things that the world have the offer, not, not seeking comfort in the bottom of a bottle, not, not seeking comfort in the arms of, of, of men or women that they're not married to, not, not seeking comfort in, in anything this world has to offer, but true joy and true thanksgiving and a true peace comes from the Lord. And so those who seek Him, let the hearts of those rejoice. Verse 11 says, seek the Lord in His strength. I saw a story where uh, I don't, I didn't, I haven't read into it. But I'm sure you've seen it made headlines. Some pastor somewhere, back in his study, preparing for a sermon, congregation waiting on him, shot himself, killed himself. Now, pastor committed suicide. I'm not sitting here. I'm not going to say, you know, what he was going through or whatever. But listen, there he was not seeking and calling upon the strength of God because at that point he was relying upon his own power. And when he felt that that wasn't adequate enough, his only choice was to take his own life. Listen, we're to seek the strength of the Lord is through God's strength. That's the only way we can make it through this earth. Listen, this world will grab you and pull you and, and try to draw you in, in, in many different directions. And the only way we can make it to the end of our journey is if we draw strength from the Lord. It's only through his strength that we can make this. And so we see in this psalm, David, th- this is uh, a great place to, to mark in your Bible. I mean, Old Testament, you know, we there's so much in the Old Testament we overlook. And it's, it's all God's word. And it says that seek his uh, the Lord and his strength, seek his face evermore. And then verse 12 says, remember his marvelous works in that part of Thanksgiving, in that part of being thankful, you, you, you sit down and you, you spend about five minutes or so and you, you reflect. So you have to remember things and, and remember where you were and where you are now or, or what you went through and how tough it was and, and how you look back on those things. And to be thankful, you remember those things. You see, remember his marvelous works, which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. See, again, this psalm is all about the Lord. Remember the song that they used to sing about David? They, they, it made Saul mad. Remember how they would sing and uh, Saul killed his thousands and David killed his tens of thousands? You know, David had a following. He's, he, he's the king at this point, too. It would be so easy for him to kind of interject something of himself into this. But we see David's heart when he's writing this. His heart is nothing of, of him in this psalm. It's all, about, it's all about God when we worship. It's nothing about us. It's all about God when we come here today. It's nothing about us. It's about, it's about worshiping Him. When we go to Thanksgiving, we're thankful for what God has given us, but none of that becomes about us. It's still all about God and what He's done in our life. If you're alive to have another Thanksgiving, rejoice in God's blessings that you're here to have a Thanksgiving. If you get to spend it with your family, if there's food on the table, the list goes on and on and on. 
on. And we're all to be thankful to God because it's our source of all of our blessings that come from. Nothing is of us. Nothing. If we didn't have the health that God gave us, we couldn't work to have money to provide food. Uh, if we didn't uh, have our health, we couldn't enjoy that. If we weren't alive, if our heart wasn't beating, everything from the littlest to the biggest, it all goes back to God. And so that focus becomes on Him. And then he says in verse 13, O seed of Israel, his servant, your children of Jacob, his chosen ones. That's us today as children of God. We're his chosen ones. So this is directed even to us as we're reading the Old Testament. We are uh, grafted in into the family of God. Verse uh, 14 says, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever. Uh, The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. It said, remember his word. The challenge for Christians today is is to obey His Word. Not just to remember it, but to act upon it, make it part of our lives, and that we can study His Word, live in His Word, and obey His Word, because we've made a covenant with God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey Him. Uh, and, And so that's what He commands us to do. And so He's given us... The Spirit to guide us. He, he's given us power over that. He's given us His Word. doesn't mean we're perfect right off the bat, but listen, there should be a growing effort in your life to obey the Word of God in every area as you grow stronger and stronger in your walk with the Lord and you grow more and more in your knowledge of His Word. He will start revealing things in your life. He will start uh, burdening you and, and start showing you some things you need to clear out. Listen, that's expected of us as Christians to know His Word, to obey His Word. It's part of this covenant, this agreement, this this uh, uh, sealing, this uh, this. Uh, between us and the Lord that's sealed in Christ's blood. Then he says in uh, verse 17, and confirmed it to Jacob for a, a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give you the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. See, today we have a new covenant with this through Christ. Uh, uh, we have a promised land. Many times we hear I'm crossing over the Jordan River in reference to someone dying and, and, and passing over into heaven. There's a, there's a promised land to come for us. There's a, there's a better day for the Christians. There's a, uh, there's a time where we're looking forward to our inheritance, which is to spend eternity in heaven with, with the Father. And that only comes through a relationship with Christ. And so we have this new covenant, a promised land, our inheritance, that is through Christ Jesus. And today, and, and so many times I've, I've spoken with people when. I've spoken with people who have nothing. I've spoken with people who who are homeless, who are on the street and and maybe are struggling. I've actually talked to a few where where they still have joy because they said, I can live in a cardboard box the rest of my life, but I know where I'm going when I draw my last breath. Listen, there are people that fall on hard times, but there's a joy that this world cannot rob them that doesn't come with money. It doesn't come with anything. It comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, there's a lot of people that are homeless and on hard times. They've made choices and they're doing nothing to get off of that. But listen, there are are those who have a joy that comes from Christ that this world can't provide. And that's us as Christians if you have that relationship with Jesus Christ. We have an inheritance that's promised through Christ. Skip on down to verse 23. He says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. That's a challenge for us today. That's a challenge to us. We're to sing to the Lord all the earth. All the earth sings. Uh, but especially for Christians today, proclaim the good news. What's the good news? That Jesus came and he died on the cross for us. That, that even though we deserve hell, we, we don't have to go there. If we we'll just turn from our sin and put our faith and trust in him. And if you've experienced that and you truly know what you've escaped from, that you don't, you don't get what you deserve anymore, uh, you still deserve it. But because of the grace and the shed blood of Christ, you don't get that when you stand before God. Christ is there as our advocate. We're to sing of that, to tell that good news from day to day. That's Every day. That's not one day of year. That's not on a a day in November that we just throw on there and this is a good spot between here and here. We're going to have a vacation day. No. Day to day is what we're supposed to do. Verse 24 says, Declare His glory among the nations. His wonder among all peoples. All peoples. That's that's everybody. You can't change that. You can't try to target a certain group. You can't uh, eliminate a certain group, uh, no matter what they believe or what they don't believe. Listen, we're to continue to share the gospel with them and, and to tell of his wonders with all peoples. Verse 27 says, for the Lord is great. Why are we here? Why are we worshiping? Because the Lord is great. 
He saved us. And, and if you're sitting there today as a Christian, he's, He saved you. Why do we come and worship? We, we come and we praise Him. Why? Because he, he, he deserves our praise. He deserves more than one or two times a week. He, he, but but we, we gather together and, and hopefully you continue your worship throughout the week and in your own way, whether it's, whether it's in prayer and Bible time and, and singing in the car, singing in the shower, whatever you do, but, but do it unto Him. Uh, give thanks unto Him every day. Why? Because He's great and He deserves it. When they, when they when they carried the ark, you would have seen this gigantic parade. You would have heard it coming from way off. Why did they do that to move the ark of the Lord? Because it was the representation of God with the people, and He deserved their very best. They would put on their best linen. They would they would they would dress themselves in the best, and and only the Levites could carry the ark. And they made this procession, and they went and they had to cleanse themselves before they could do that. Why did they go through all that? Because God deserves it. Because God deserves our best. God deserves the best of what we have. Because everything we have, it came from Him. We don't have anything of our own. We, there's not one penny in the bank that you own. There's not one parcel of land anywhere that, that you own. It's all His. We're just using it. He's blessed us with, with things of His. And, and then He expects us to use what He blesses us with to further His kingdom, to bless others because we've been blessed. And so we, we, we give this to the Lord and we, we serve Him and we're thankful because He's worthy. He is worthy. Verse 25 says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. Verse 26 says, For all gods of the people are idols. You know what that word idols means? It says they're worthless. All those little idols, all those little g-gods, all those false things, they're worthless. But the Lord made the heavens. You see the difference? There's only one God. There's only one person. That, uh, there's only one God that, that made the heavens. There's only one God that spoke us into existence. All these other little gods that man has created, they're worthless. And David's even addressing this. It says, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. For all gods and the peoples are idols, they're worthless. But the Lord made the heavens. Verse 27 says, honor and majesty are before him. No other, no other God. Only honor and majesty before our God. Strength and gladness are in his place. Verse 28, it says, give to the Lord. You see, this whole emphasis is all upon the Lord, to be thankful unto the Lord, to talk about the Lord, to be uh, sing of the Lord's praises, to the, the Lord's works. It's, it's all about the Lord. You see why nobody wants to do Thanksgiving anymore? Because it's not about me. I'm not getting any gra- uh, praise and glory. I'm not getting any, any credit. I can't boast about anything me. To be thankful is to be humble. Uh, to, to, not, to, to have thanks, it means to, uh, you, you can't be prideful. In other words, you, you've got to give uh, thanks to someone else and not you. And so this pride that we battle is so hard uh, for us in, in this world that we live in today. And so thanksgiving is all about God. And in a world that we live in that gets further and further away, we know the thankfulness goes further and further away. He says, give to the Lord glory and strength. Verse 29 says, give to the Lord and glory do His name. Bring an offering and come before Him, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. There's a beautiful thing called holiness that God looks at when He sees a Christian who's living and trying to obey His Word and trying to get rid of the things in their life and trying to live more and more away from the world and more and more for Him. It says, in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is the beautiful thing before our God. Holiness is what He commands. Holiness is what He gives us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, a garment, a robe of righteousness, a clean garment, and He expects us to keep that garment clean. He expects us to not go back and jump in the wallows and the mire and the muck and the sin. He expects us to walk in a path that's pleasing to Him. And it says it's beautiful, this thing of holiness is beautiful to God. Yes, there's a redemptive work through the shed blood. Yes, there's a, there's a continual washing. But, but shame on us if we use that as an excuse to continue to live in sin because that's not holiness. And it says that beauty, the beautiful of holiness, the beauty is in holiness. Oh, worship the Lord. We, we can't raise our hands and worship God uh, if we have sin in our life because then we, there, it's hindering our worship. It's hindering our prayer. Uh, even in the passage, it says, how can you lift up hands stained with blood uh, to worship God? It says there's a thing of holiness that He commands us. Tremble, verse 30 says, before Him all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. 
Listen, God has his hand upon this nation. God has his hand upon this whole world. It is God who rules and reigns. He establishes kingdoms. He tears down kingdoms all to establish his purpose. Be thankful that God is still in control and running the affairs of this world that we live in. Yes, man is doing everything they can to go farther and farther away from him, but there's still one who's in control, and his name is the Lord. Let all the heavens rejoice. Verse 32 says, Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that is in it. Verse 33 says, Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord. Verse 33 says, This is the day that we're looking forward to, for he is coming to judge the earth. Christ is coming back. That's why we... That's what we here to worship. That's why we're, we're, we're look forward to that day. But we're not resting on that day and, and sitting on our, on our backside, sitting on our hands. There's work to be done until He comes. But verse 33 reminds us, says, For He's coming to judge the earth. Verse 34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. And say, Save us, O God of our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles. Listen, God is going to come and gather His church one day because He comes to save us. He says that He comes, He came to seek and save that which is lost. And so for us that realized we were lost, that cried out to God and said, Save us, we have that promise of salvation. He's coming back one day for His church. He says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He's good. And then verse 35 says, Save us to give thanks to Your holy name, to triumph in Your praise. And then verse 36, He concludes and says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. From everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said amen. And they praised the Lord. You see this whole thing that they were doing. Was nothing about them. Wasn't to boast in their victory. Wasn't about to boast in their status. Wasn't about to boast in their success. Wasn't about to boast in their possessions. It wasn't to boast in their kingdom. Boast in their king. uh, Boast in anything except for the Lord. It's really what the Bible commands us. If we're going to boast in anything. Boast in the Lord, if you have to brag and give and, and do something, brag on what God's done for you. Brag on, on the fact that, hey, uh, I was lost, but now I'm saved through the shed blood of Christ. I, I repented of my sins and I trusted in him. But in this, this, this psalm, go back and read this sometime where you can just, it's just, it's just easy, easy to read and understand what he's saying. There's no hidden agenda. There's no, uh, you don't need a Hebrew or a lexicon. You can read this and take it for what it says. He says, give thanks to the Lord. You don't need a degree to figure that out. Be thankful to God for what He's given you. But then you don't just sit on the stuff that He's given you. He commands us to go and proclaim His goodness. To, to, to share that goodness. To proclaim the peace and the joy. Uh, to, uh, to go out into all the peoples and all the nations. Why do we worship Him? It says because He's worthy to be worshipped. He deserves our worship. He commands our worship. And one day He's coming back to judge the nations. This week, as you go into this week of thanksgiving, be thankful to the one who deserves it. Be thankful to the only one we're to be thankful to, and that's to be thankful unto the Lord.